Good afternoon or good morning maybe for some of you. It's really great to be here with you. It's my pleasure. So managing well-being and performance and resilient leadership, how much they have in common. So resilience, normally we think about how do we survive and especially bounce back uh, when we have certain difficulties like COVID. To me and, and to my colleagues, resilience is also how to thrive, how to really excel uh, in, in difficult times and, and all times. Uh, we think, and I personally think, that this managing the developing performance paradox may well be the holy grail of the 21st century leader. What is the paradox? Paradox is something where you have two polarities somehow feeling that they are contradicting. At the same time, there's a certain interdependence between them. If you think about paradoxes, I think leadership has always been about managing paradoxes like efficiency and quality or innovation. Uh, we have seen those in Harvard Business Review, front pages, all kinds of paradoxes what leaders need to manage. This is one of the new paradoxes, so because work nowadays, and I would claim that leadership as well, is actually becoming even more demanding. This whole VUCA world, what we talk about, volatile uncertainty, where we see really this all, all ambiguity what we have. I mean, this world is something that you need to be able to really understand things holistically. You need to have very clever mind. You need to have good thinking capacity, good cognitive capacity. And that, of course, needs well-being. Well-being, physical, it's psychological, mental, it's also social. And all of those need to be in place in order to perform in an optimal manner. So what leaders need, can do in order to really enable this paradox of performance and well-being that people and organizations could have both of those together. I will touch four different topics which are scientifically very valid. And first one is, how do we enable authenticity? Authenticity, you could think about it in two ways. From our academic point of view, we have an essentialist approach, which basically thinks that you are who you are. You discover yourself, you have self-awareness, and then you act in line with that identity, what you have, with your essential self. Then we have existentialist approach, where the whole idea is that, yes, I know myself, and I know what I could be. Something may be a bit more, a bit better than, than what I am today. And then I choose to become that. So I basically have accountability and responsibility for that choice, and I leave it through. So from authenticity point of view, the whole point is that if you are able to live authentic life, kind of holistically, also at work, we know from studies that it's really associated positively with well-being, engagement, performance, and job satisfaction. There's quite a recent meta-analysis just done, and then there were tens of different studies covered, and basically only two studies a little bit contradicted with this one, but all the rest were clearly showing that if you are able to live authentically, work uh, kind of have authentic life at work as well, actually you are going to be more engaged. You are going to be having high performance and you are going to be, do, do well and you are going to have job satisfaction. So what is really the, if we think from leadership point of view, how can we make it happen? Today we talk a lot about psychological safety. There are a lot of studies that psychological safety actually correlates with a lot of good things. So if and when we are able to have psychological safety, this kind of inclusive culture in our organization, people are then freely expressing themselves. Basically, they are able to do mistakes. They can be honest about them. They can basically tell when they have different opinions, when they have new ideas, they are free to really tell them. There's no fear. So basically, they don't need to be afraid of humiliation or blame. There is kind of fundamental belief in good intentions, that it's good to share, it's good to trust and respect uh, each other. So this psychological safety 
is the key enabler for authentic life in our workplace. And when we have that psychological safety and people can be authentic selves in the organization, that will lead to well-being and performance as well. The second topic, uh, what I would like to cover is we as leaders, if we are able to help people to balance their life demands and life resources, actually they are going to have both well-being and performance. There's a lot of studies about this one. This job demand resources model is, is one great example. And then I'm going to talk about two others. So first one is this kind of demand control support meaning model, which is well studied as well. And, and, and this is an inter interesting concept because basically this says that if you have higher demands in your job, as long as you take care of that people have control in their life and in their work so that they are more autonomous, they have more flexibility there. And, and, and if they have support, so basically they have great relationships and support from manager uh, as well as their colleagues. And if they feel meaning so that, hey, there's some meaning in my, at my work. So if, even though job demands are increasing, people are not having burnouts, people are not really uh, having all the negative effects uh, of well-being, basically bad well-being. So if you look at that uh, picture, what is there now, you can see that healthy work is something where you have strong support, where you have high control, and then where basically you have also high meaning at your work. And if that's the case, even the demands can be quite high, and you are still not having um, ill-being at, at, at work. So those are critical. In our own data, we have done this kind of quite huge uh, data gathering from uh, multiple organizations where we have 3,000 plus individuals answering, and they are all knowledge workers. We had more than 50 different measures, validated measures we have been covering, and we have been looking really at what really drives thriving I learning and vitality that people have energy. What really drives work engagement and what would drive burnout risk minimization? So when you look at the correlations, you can see that this stru structural equation model here is quite complicated and I'm not going to all details. You can see that um, uh, the correlations are quite high and you can also see that statistically these are, these are really relevant findings. Uh, on, the, on the left hand side you have some cultural elements and you can see that mastery climate, a climate where you can cooperate and you can exchange knowledge, you can learn, basically you develop yourself, is a climate which really drives these important mediators, i.e. meaningfulness and then from Desi Ryan's self-determination theory, autonomy, relatedness and competence. And psychological safety, what we just discussed, is here, so one, one measure that also correlates with those mediators. And then fair policies, that people feel that there is justice and they have just policies, they are treated justly that's, and fairly, that's also key here. You can see their competitive performance climate, and competitive performance climate where you really compete against your colleagues, where you need to prove that you are worth and you are able to achieve, that actually doesn't have that much correlation with all these positive things. It do have a correlation with uh, energy. So if you look at this one, so these mediators here in the middle seem to be key. So if you have meaning, if you are able to perceive meaningfulness, autonomy, relatedness, that you have good support, good relationships with your colleagues, and that you can also perceive this kind of competence that I can achieve, I know and I develop, then actually those are all correlating with learning, vitality, engagement, and also lower burnout risk. So, so what this tells us is that we need to, if, you, as, if we as leaders and in organizations are able to drive this perception of meaningfulness, autonomy, relatedness, and competence, people are going to be more committed, engaged, and then also do, doing better. 
And we can see then what cultural elements also are driving this one. The third topic, uh, what we have, is helping people balance activity and recovery. So it's not only balancing the demands and resources, but another dimension of balance is balancing activity and recovery. So what is really balancing activity and recovery? So the same study I just discussed uh, earlier, uh, we also looked that what, uh, what really correlated with these mediators, and you can see there the mediators, meaningfulness, autonomy, relatedness, and competence. And you can see that mental recovery seemed to have a key, key correlation with this. If you think recovery, you could think recovery as a physical recovery and then mental recovery. Physical recovery links a lot to sleep. We talk nowadays a lot about sleep and how sleep drives well-being, and it is true. At the same time, in our, our analysis with knowledge workers, it was really interesting that sleep itself, we really measured sleep in many ways. We measured how many hours people slept, uh, when they uh, went to sleep, was it easy to get sleep, whether they woke up during the night, how did they feel in the morning. And all of the, with all of those measures, we didn't find correlation with these important mediators. We didn't find correlation with thriving, engagement, neither burnout, low burnout. It is very interesting, but where we really found a, a, this correlation was with mental recovery. Mental recovery seems to be associated with meaningfulness, autonomy, relatedness, and competence. Mental recovery, what we really uh, measured here was uh, detachment, relaxation, control, and mastery, and I will talk uh, shortly about those. Then you can see the well-being orientation, and you can see that points well-being orientation really correlated with active life. So if you're able to measure that people and help people to be more oriented to well-being, it seems that they will be more active, as well as that they will have more uh, mental recovery. Then you see working hours there because people talk about, a lot about working hours as well, and it works paradoxically. It's basically totally understandable that working hours have an impact, negative uh, correlation with um, associated with mental recovery, but actually it has positive association with meaningfulness, autonomy, relatedness, and competence directly. So even though kind of indirectly working hours might have a bit negative impact, you can see that basically it has also positive correlation. How is it? Okay, it's easy to understand that if you're really feeling that your work is meaningful, you feel this autonomy, you like your colleagues and then managers, and then you work well with them, and you, you really feel this achievement. So your needs are really supported well and fulfilled at work, then it's easy that you might work kind of longer hours. We see that actually if it goes over, it, it's going to decrease clearly mental recovery and it will have negative uh, effects as well. But this is a bit of a paradox here. What we also saw what comes to low burnout or burnout risk, we saw that for knowledge workers who are really thriving, it's so that they easily have also heightened burnout risk, higher burnout risk. So higher burnout risk is actually something that comes easily with the flow, and there's a risk involved. So we as leaders, we need to give tools for our key uh, employees, for our employees to really manage the burnout risk, to really manage their well-being so that they don't go over. But if they are really thriving, if they are really excited about their work, they most probably are, they, they, it's very difficult to see that they would have really, really low burnout risk, uh, or that, that they would always have, that's maybe the better way to say it. In our data, clearly, those people who are thriving and who really ha are feeling all the positive things at work, they also easily had a bit higher burnout, burnout risk. So coming back to mental recovery, which is key here now, there are these four different elements. And, and then first one is relaxation here. 
So do I have relaxing things? Do I, do I do relaxing things in my free time? Also, uh, all kinds of relaxation exercises are good here, breathing exercises. I, am I able to really relax in my free time? The other one is detachment. Can I distance myself from my work in my free time? So, or whether my kind of brain is continually actively going also when I go home. So, detachment is key for our brain and mental recovery. So, if you have a feeling and if you, if you see that, and you could discuss with the employees, that's the other thing, is that how, how able they are to de uh, detach, especially now in this COVID world where we are having Teams meetings all the time or Zoom meetings, it's, it can happen that it's a bit more difficult to detach. These routines, how you detach from your work, have, have changed. Then we have mastery. So for mental recovery, actually, it's interesting that if you seek out intellectual challenges in your free time, like puzzle here or playing check or reading some, something interesting, uh, that actually gives you mental recovery. It's something totally different from your work. Your brain shifts, your thinking, your cognitive load is coming from different direction in a way. And, and that's why it's actually giving you mental recovery. And the fourth one is control. So do I have this um, autonomy at my work and in my life that I can really determine myself how I will spend my free time? So these four elements seem to be key, and they are a bit working differently uh, and have different associations, but all of them are important when we are thinking about well-being and performance of our, our employees. Then the fourth one, the fourth area and last area is really how do we enable smart activity? You can be active in two different ways. You can basically just do activity without really developing your routines and, and, and thinking about what are my priorities. So how to have these smart activities, these kind of effective and renewed work practices and routines in this new hybrid world. Uh, there's one interesting, um, and, the, and this is not really a huge source of um, data. This is more one, one study which is interesting is Morten Hansen's Great at Work study, where he was really measuring what is the performance versus our practices, work practices. And you can see there that when we correlate these seven uh, smart work practices, I will show you them um, shortly. And then if you use them, kind of there's high on the right hand side, what is your performance uh, on, on, the, on the more uh, vertical, vertical axis? And you can see that there's a great correlation between the smart work practices and, and performance. And based on this, basically he claims that more than half uh, of performance is explained by these work, uh, smart work practices. And then also that there's basically seven times more performance differences than, than compared to working hours, what we just discussed about. So what are they smart work practices? This is not... <laughs> kind of any rocket science, this one. Basically, first one is that, hey, have fewer priorities. So do less, prioritize well, and then obsess, basically keep on focusing on those priorities as the first one. The second one is redesign your work. So focus on value. So focus on the outcomes rather than the activity. When you keep kind of, when you are clear on your focus and then you really focus on that work, then, and on those few priorities, you, you get better outcome. Then, third one is about learning. So, let's not just repeat the same thing all the time. Let's think how could we improve our skills, our practices, how could we learn from what we do and do it better next time. Fourth one is seek roles that match your purpose. We know that when, when you are doing something which you really feel meaningful, which is close to your purpose, then actually you can, you then, you are going to get better outcome. You are going to perform better. Fifth one is use influencing and inspirational tactics to gain support of others. So these are these kind of, how do we, how, how, how good we are in these social interactions. And then fewer 
but more meaningful meetings. So meetings seem to be a lot of trouble in many organizations. We have too many meetings, we, they are too long, we don't prepare for the meetings, and they are not that well organized. And seventh one is how do you learn to say no? And this links, of course, to priorities. So not rocket science, but if you really work on these ones, you can do a lot more with your limited time. So as a summary, so what are really the essentials of leading well-being and performance paradox? So we need to know when we are living this hybrid world where basically now there's more remote work, but then there's also office work. And, and, and when the expectations have also changed, people are now working on the culture, organizational structures, leadership styles, and then work designs. So we should shape them in a way that we, we really have this culture of psychological safety where people are allowed to be authentic. But it's not only psychological safety, but there's also a culture of healthy challenge because that leads to achievement and development. When we design those new work practices and structures and cultures, we, we, that's, we should aim to that one that people can have a feeling of meaning, autonomy, relatedness, and competence. Also, when we design new practices, are we able to help people to balance their life demands and life resources? And how could we have smart and effective work practices? How could we maybe have even something generic for our organization? Are our current practices very smart? Are they allowing these smart and effective work practices? And then there's a certain couple of other points for people managers, especially. It seems that people management is actually even more demanding in this hybrid world. Some people have been talking about that, do we really need people managers in the future? Do we need managers in the future? But actually, it seems that there's even more role for people managers. And then if we support our employees to know themselves and lead oneself better, that will help them greatly. And then to manage that paradox of well-being and performance and actively follow and support their well-being, performance, and development. And of course, for us all as leaders, we need to positively role model all the above. So this is all what I had to say, those four different areas which would help to manage the paradox of well-being and performance. And, and here, we, as a summary, we had those couple of key, key essentials which could help us to, to manage this paradox. Thank you. Thank you, Juha. We have been uh, getting several questions uh, from our viewers uh, in the meantime, and uh, please do send more of those questions. Um, if we can't answer them all, which is likely in our time, uh, maybe we can ask some of them to be answered perhaps uh, by writing uh, uh, later. I'll just uh, pick a few of those, those here. Uh, one um, kind of interesting question, I think, was that uh, uh, these mediators that were mentioned, uh, relatedness, meaningfulness, competence, and autonomy, um, is it possible to argue that these mediators could be causing higher working hours? I assume that this person who asked means in a positive sense mm, that people mm. could be made, made to do more hours to the kind of positive extent, but not yeah. too much, of course. Yeah, it is, it is definitely so, and the, that we can see from our data that basically those people who feel those, they tend to work longer hours. Mm -hmm. And of course, for us as managers, it's also we need to help people to, that, they, it, that they, it doesn't go over, of course, yeah. because that can lead to then negative effects in the, in, in the end. Sure, sure, yes. Um, there's a very, very broad question, but if there's a short answer to it or some nuggets of, uh, of, of, of uh, viewpoints into this. How would you monitor burnouts yourself? I suppose there are many ways, and there are how yeah. those could, could be visible to a manager, but how, how, how would you do that? Yeah, I mean, burnout risk is, is sometimes difficult to see personally and as a leader, because we kind of tend to get used to it. So little by little, we just get to used to it that we are a bit kind of foggy in our mind, or we, we don't sleep as well as before. But I think for managers to have a discussion with the employee and also personally to just think that we, we talk about this kind of red dress from Matrix, that what is your red dress kind of what comes to your, this kind of uh, symptom which comes into your life and, and which tells you immediately that now I'm in a danger zone. Yeah. For me personally, it's my sleep. 
So that if, if I basically start to wake up during the morning and then I have all my kind of brain going, <laughs> going on, then I know that, okay, now I start to be close to that danger mm. zone. I need to kind of think about it and then yeah. maybe a bit calm down. But everyone has something. Some have stomach ache. Some have uh, um, basically they can see it in the heart, heart rate. They, people can see it in different ways. And it's important to learn to know our own kind of what are our topics of physiological, yeah, yeah, reaction. physiological reactions which tell us that now we are getting a bit over. And we as leaders, we, we tend to see from people then that, that maybe they don't, some memory, that some problems with, uh, just with their organizing, that they do something which they wouldn't normally do, mm -hmm. as an example. That would yeah. be a kind of time to ask, okay, why that yeah. happens. Which makes it important, of course, to know one's subordinates as well Absolutely. as possible, something that mm -hmm. might be more difficult in this current, current hybrid work uh, situation, of course. And uh, of course, when people do tend often to be, be very, very busy, that tends to put a strain on the leader, of course, indeed, in that, uh, that they should somehow try to find the time to actually see and perceive how their, their people are doing, actually. And that's, mm. I think, often all too easy to kind of forego that and that. Uh, just uh, focus on the organizing and managing instead of the leadership. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. yeah, I mean, this is this balance that uh, managing facts and, 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 and the things and managing then people and the emotions, and, and that's kind of a balance good managers are able to do both. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. very much at the, at the heart of uh, where you come from, from this uh, uh, speech and um, how it's, how it's uh, framed and designed. Uh, would you have any suggestions of the influencing tactics that uh, could be used um, as part of the one of the uh, smart, smart work tactics to gain the support of others? And the support of others. Yeah, this is a good question. And I, I mean, this is, I think this is really coming back to basic psychology, which has not really changed. We tend to think that everything is changing because technology is moving so fast. But we as people, our psychology, psychologically and, and biologically, we haven't really changed too much. Yeah. So I would say that these basic things that having empathy and, and just listening and trying to inter don't interpret too much, ask questions that, okay, what did you really mean with that one? Yeah. Because very, very often our, our interpretations are actually wrong. And, and, and then we just keep them as fact after a while. Mm. And, and it's dangerous. So actually maybe we should all read a bit Greek philosophers and, and some basic psychology <laughs> yeah. and remind ourselves a little, a little on that as well. Yeah. I think this is an important question, although you have been touching parts of this, but I'll ask anyhow, uh, how or in which possible good ways to approach the people in order to follow their well-being or also to, to take it up to actually discuss it if you, if you, even if you would know mm -hmm. that is, that is not going as well as supposed. What would be the ways of approaching them? That depends probably hugely on the person and the circumstance, but do you have some general pointers? Yeah, I mean, first of all, I, I need to say that, that this is situational, that you need to, as you said, Marcus, that when you know your employees, you know how to approach them, that what people like. I mean, some people definitely want yeah. to have face-to-face -face meeting, and, and, and you, it's better to ask questions rather than, than mm -hmm. assume. So, like, I can't assume that someone has now a burnout risk or, or that they, something happens there in their mind, but I can always ask questions. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, this is a very, very insightful pr presentation, as one of the commentators actually explicitly said. I think it's, it's clear and a very, very big and important topic. There would be a lot to ask, a lot to ask here. Uh, I'll, I'll ask one more question. Uh, we cannot be at balance all the time. Mm -hmm. Have you studied, or based on your experience, uh, what are some timely or suitable cycles in well-being versus performance? Uh, I, I don't know how, how this is meant precisely, but uh, yeah. if there needs to be trade-offs done, of course, it would not be yeah. optimal to have to need to make any trade-offs with that, or, or is it well-being always the first thing which also is, is important as such, but also drives good outcomes? Mm -hmm for its part. Yeah, I, I think there are cycles. So first cycle is kind of hourly cycle, that you need to have always that 10 minutes break for your brain, 
and, and that's hourly cycle. During the day, you need to have your sleep and you need to have your recovery. During the week, you need, it would be great that you have that one day for recovery. But then if you think about the longer cycles, it is interesting, and I think where maybe the, uh, the uh, listener really referred to is that sometimes we are just hugely busy. Mm. And it's just fact of life that most of us, we, every now and then we might have days or weeks or even months that it's actually we need to kind of have full speed and we let go a bit from our great habits of recovery and, 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 and great nutrition and all that. But it, it can't be, it can't continue, that's the point. You can have those kind of urgent times and, and, and where you really push with, and, and, and then you need to keep certain key routines still. I mean, for instance, a certain level of sleep. But, but then in a normal setting, you basically follow all these great kind of rules what we discussed or, or ideas today. But then you have two other kind of times. There is this kind of recovery time, kind of a longer cycle recovery, like it could be a longer holiday. Uh, and, and, and then you could have like a renewal time, like people decide that now I'm going to use six months for studying new stuff. Mm. And, and so, so you might have this kind of... Um, longer cycles as well when we think about this, mm. these topics. 